Hello. Sí. Hi, Aurora. Hola, Aurora. Hi. Hello. ¿Cómo está Aurora? Hi, Muy bien. Gusto de verte, Dona. Yeah. Muy contento de estar aquí. Eh. Uh, you know, Alvaro, yeah. before, before we have the speaker, we always do a little Portuguese or Spanish, you know, but after okay. the speaker is around, we get through. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> And I see that Guillermo has joined. It's a good mixture. Oh, yeah. Hola, Alvaro. Hola, Guillermo. Hola, Guillermo. Oh. Hola, 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 Aurorita. Hola, Hola. Hola, Hola. Hola. <laughs> No, we, we usually, uh, the first uh, few minutes, we, we just do some small talk here, Alvaro. Okay. Uh, I mean, we're Latin Americans. People, uh, there, are, there are people that have the wrong link. There are people that are still, you know. <laughs> like me? <laughs> coffee. Hello, everybody. Hi, Hello. Hi, 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 How are you? How are you? Hi. So we already have, I would say that we already have some five or six countries here, at least. Maybe more than that. Uh, and, and we're still less than 20 people, so... We'll soon reach 10 countries, at least. That, that, that's the average that we've had, which is, which is great. Uh, it means that uh, we are being successful in getting people together. Uh, we think, uh, of course, Donna is doing a great job there with uh, the Panamanian uh, students, and we have graduate students from uh, different countries uh, participating, and, and, and also some, some students from Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro that come, come from all over the place. So even the, the, the names that do not look very Latin American, it's because it's students uh, from other parts of the world that are here. Like with Alexander us. Gremel? Yep. <laughs> or something like that. Oh, oh yeah, that, that, that could be one of them. <laughs> right. You're talking about that German guy? Or Donna Ropper? I'm Panamanian. No, Donna, Donna Ropper, I, I think I'm from Panama. I think Donna Ropper is the German, a, a is British singer, right? It's the German surname, but I'm Panamanian. <laughs> I, I was and going to say you a British singer. And I. <laughs> Does Marie count for, for an Uruguayan? She, that Only. Was and a French name, <laughs> with a French name. Yeah, Marie yeah. and Macadar, a, a Uruguay, uh, maybe a Uruguayan, but only if uh, some of our other Latin American colleagues here depicts your Uruguayan accent in your... In my speech, when I speak your, Spanish. When, when you speak English. Oh, when I speak English? <laughs> okay, oh my gosh. No, she actually, she has a Brazilian accent when she speaks English. Does yeah, she? probably, because I learned Portuguese before English, probably, so, no. <laughs> It's not oh, like Argentinians okay. that you immediately recognize they are from Argentina when you speak English. Uh, when they say, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the kind of accent that we have? I don't think we have any Argentina here. We do. Alvaro is there. Oh, I'm so uh, Alvaro, sorry. Alvaro. Alvaro is Colombian. I'm Colombian. No, no, no. Sorry. No, the other Alvaro. There's, oh. yeah, there's, oh. there's, there's the other Alvaro, Alvaro uh, Pino is, okay. is, is Argentinian. Although he's, he's now in Brazil. Uh, which makes him a, a hybrid, uh, uh, the same yeah, way. So he's Brazilian. Yeah. He's in Brazil. He's Brazilian. <laughs> uh, all right. I think uh, more people will be joining us. Uh, Pablo, I just wanted to say hi because I'm not going to be able to stay for the whole thing, but I will be here as much as I can. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Alfaro, uh, Guilherme is not the only one who's here. At least to say hello to you. I know that Pepe, uh, sir, Pepe, uh, that doesn't that does, doesn't want us to call him Pepe. Jose. Uh, no. Robles. I never say I can never pronounce his name correctly. Uh, if he's not uh, already with us, he will join us uh, just to say hello. He says that he, he could only be here for that. Repeat after me. Robles. Ro, ro, Robles. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Robles. One day we'll learn. <laughs> Robles. All right. One day we'll learn. Okay. Uh, well, it's it's a pleasure for us to have a Latin American who, who has developed uh, uh, his career uh, abroad, uh, abroad in, in, this in Europe. Uh, has studied in, in England, has, uh, well, teaches in, in Spain. So he probably gives the perspective of a Latin American looking at information systems, but at the same time uh, has that also the, the perspective of uh, 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 those countries that usually generate the technology that we end up uh, uh, adopting afterwards, right? Uh, so thank you very much for, for being here with us. Alvaro, in fact, Alvaro was, uh, I consider him an enthusiast of this thing because when we decided to, to have the second round of, uh, of research seminars this year, he was one of the first guys that said, I want to be part of that. And we, we, <laughs> we, think, we thank people that, uh, uh, that, I mean, that have the same kind of uh, uh, perspective of the way we, we, we should uh, get together in, in Latin America. In Spanish, in Spanish, we say, le gusta la mala vida. Le gusta la mala vida, okay. Well, and so then, were, and then last week I was saying, why? Yes, I, yes. <laughs> I know, but, but then, then it was too late to regret. Uh, right. <laughs> another, another reason for us to thank Alvaro is because he's doing this uh, in the evening, so it's time that he could be sharing uh, with his loved ones and he's here uh, with us, which 
only shows uh, how much uh, he cares for what uh, he's doing. Thank you very much for that, Alvaro. Uh, with well, not without further ado, let me uh, do it a little more formally. I think I have uh, two slides here that I can share. Uh, uh, not that one for sure. I'm all messed up with my slides here. Uh, the, 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 the one with the, the title of Alvaro's uh, talk, In the Search of Business Models for Data Sharing. Uh, he has uh, sent uh, us a few uh, papers that uh, I know that uh, at least some of you have uh, read and will have maybe some, some questions or, or remarks uh, that you can pose to, to Alvaro later on. Uh, as I told you before, Alvaro is a professor of information systems and technology in the IE Business School in Spain. Uh, he has uh, studied uh, systems engineering uh, and computation in, uh, in in Latin America in in the Losandi, uh, Universidad de Los Andes, uh, and then later on he got an MS um, a master and a doctoral um, degree in in computation from uh, Oxford University. So if he has any British accent in his English, <laughs> that's not from talking uh, with us, right? It's it, it's it's from from somewhere else. Uh, Alvaro, uh, now without uh, any further ado, uh, well, the floor is yours. Uh, please, thank you very much for, for being with us. Thank you very much. Um, it's really, really a pleasure to be here, actually. Um, and I'm very, very happy to be joining the talks and, and the community uh, as, as a Latin American living, living abroad for a long time, actually. So it's really, really happy to reconnect it on that. Um, let me try to share my presentation. So, what I was mentioning, really happy to be here. Um, Alex was saying, introducing to myself, I'm Colombian, actually. I'm from the Caribbean part of Colombia, so my English are going to, to listen a little bit of more than British accent, more Caribbean accent, actually. <laughs> right, so I'm, 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 I consider I'm a latecomer in the information system community, actually, because for many years, I was more mainly active in the computer science community, actually. So my undergraduate and my doctorate, it was in computation. Actually, and I, I, I end up in the information system because one of my main research area is requirement engineering. Actually, it's dating requirements, which is something which got commonalities with information system and computer science. Actually, and then I found it more interesting and more exciting the information system research on that. Uh, and then so I decided to, to focus mainly my work, my recent work in information system, actually. Um, I arrived in Spain as well after living almost 12 years in the UK. I decided to come to, to I Business School. I got um, uh, my position as faculty there. And my main research, actually, when I arrived in IE, I arrived mainly uh, because they were looking for somebody interested in cybersecurity. So that's my main research area, we can say. But gradually as well, I'm interested in, rather than cybersecurity itself, it's like how to design secure system, how to use designs, uh, how to use system in a very secure and trustworthy way and also getting more and more in emerging technology and digital technologies, actually. So this is an example of you, my work. Actually, I have been working on e-government, e-health, um, in security and information uh, in IoT, and recently um, exploring and doing a project with some colleagues in North Europe on blockchain, and on also the principal investigator for IE in another project, which is more IES, in which we are trying to design or to develop uh, an index of digital maturity in children. We are investigating how children use technology, and this is a multidisciplinary um, project, European project with doctors, psychologists, food researchers, and try to develop a multidisciplinary view and an index of how, how much are children in the use of technology as well. Okay, so when Alex invited me, very, uh, very nice of him inviting me, um, he came with the idea that, um, um, Right, what should I talk about? Because I've been in several projects. And, and one of the projects that I'm, I'm presenting today is based on a paper that has been already published, but it's an ongoing project that I carry on working, actually. Um, and it's a project in which a few years ago, um, before going coming to IE, I was working very strongly with the open science community, the data sharing, the e science community, actually. And then when I moved to a business school, several of my colleagues in several meetings, they have been saying, why you don't investigate a bit about the business model, actually? So the whole idea, of the, and that's the title of my talk, is in searching of the business model for data sharing, actually. So the whole idea of data sharing is the practice of making data, right, data available for other investigators, sharing data, actually. But usually we, we tend to associate data sharing with just sharing data sets. And actually it's much more than that. 
There are several organizations around the world and huge projects right, are in data sharing, and this involves complex information and communication infrastructure, as well as organizational issues. Right? And the whole community, in many of the cases, the whole community has been funded by, by the research councils in their own country. That's the reality in most of the countries. But the same government, the same research council, are telling the guys, guys, you need to be sustainable. You need to be long-term sustainable and not depending on that. This is important for research. This is important for your scientific projects, but you need to be able to, to, to be sustainable in the long term, actually. So the challenge that we came with this project, brought by some of my colleagues, was how we try to make this more sustainable. What is the business model that we should have operating on that? So let me start bringing some example of data sharing, actually. And this is perhaps the most uh, important project so far in data sharing. Actually, the Human Genome Project, which was a project that was uh, running for several years, actually, and it got a project that almost multiplied by 10 or 20 times the money that the American government invests in the project. Actually, try to discount the whole genome map on that, and that requires sharing data in several organizations, actually, and manipulating the data and creating data and, and having really a success. But this is something which several organizations are coming to sharing data in the way that they are doing it. This is, for instance, we got here in Europe last year a call from EU, actually, and there were several initiatives in trying to data sharing, the, sharing data around COVID, actually. In for drug discovery, for medicine, uh, the creating medicines, but also researching how to uh, take care of patients, how to manage the whole situation in a better way. Actually, so researchers have been sharing data on that. So that what I was mentioning, um, the whole community has been saying for a long time they need to understand what is the business model and how this business model can be sustainable. And that's what we became in my case, actually, the whole idea of business model and business model somehow is related with the value creation. Actually. And that's the reason that I, I call the talk a value perspective, because I follow the whole idea of the business model and that central in the business model is that notion of creating and capture value. Actually. So we aim to investigate how value is created in data sharing and how can that value created through data sharing be sustainable. Actually. So it's not only creating value, but to have that issue of having sustainability. And that was the whole genesis of the project, the whole idea. And, and part of the, of the initial results, actually, which is mainly what I've been talking here, um, have been published already in the Justice Journal, actually. Um, and it is a collaboration with two former colleagues, GMA Go, she is in Simon Fraser University in Canada. We used to work together here in IE, and we, we, we collaborate a lot. And the other um, collaborators, one of my former colleagues when I was working in STFC in the UK, Brian Matthews, which is the one that has been pushing me with the idea. Okay, let's let's try to analyze the business model and then let's try to have the information system view about how can we model or create, analyze um, creation of value in data sharing initiative actually. So let me start with a little bit of background. So as a mini work, we embarked analyzing what is in the in, in the literature of this. What has been the research that have been doing on that? And mainly two main line of research have been that we analyzed. One is on data sharing, and the other one is in the business model actually. So most of the research in data sharing has been focusing on the enablers, the driver, the benefits, or the challenge of data sharing actually. There were plenty of, of papers on that. From the perspective of information systems, these are an example three of the papers related to data sharing. Actually, the main focus has been on how we manage the technological infrastructure that sustain data sharing, actually. So in many of the cases, that infrastructure requires very complex uh, technological devices and also organizational infrastructure. For instance, one of the papers, the paper by Venters in, all in, in MSQ, is analyzing the infrastructure used by the CERN here in Switzerland for, with the Large Hydrogen Collider. In order, that was one of the huge experiments of the large um, the largest experiment in particle physics, and they have a huge devices to sharing data and managing large amount of data that they were generated. Actually, so that's one of the papers that, that I mentioned that. But in, in reality, in both sides, in the data sharing literature and in the information literature, uh, system literature, nobody has been analyzed the operational model of the data sharing and also the issues of how we can create the payment model, the value and sustainability in that creation of value that we can do on that. Actually. So 
that motivated us to go the other line of research to investigate. That was the, the, the line of research on business model, actually, which is something which in management literature there are tons of, of publication on that um, with several perspectives. Um, one of them could be a holistic description of, of the business model or using research view of the firms for analyzing the business model or having a business model as compiles, uh, composing of several elements like the work of Walter Walder that had been popularized with the Canvas business model, actually. Uh, in IES, business model is mainly seen as a tool for departing, innovating, evaluating the business logic of organization and somehow creating categorizations and synonyms of different kind of, of business model. Um, and I would say we were really lucky in, when we initiated this research to find a paper in the European Journal of Information System by David and Allison. Actually, Allison has been published a paper in which he tried to unify the different views and clarify the concept of business model from the information system perspective. And we decided that for this research, we want to use that paper as our, as our guide, actually. So, okay, so we want to analyze business model in data sharing from the information system view. So let's use this paper, which somehow was one of the few that have a unifying view for the whole community, actually. So we use it as a, as a main guide. And this is the way that Avison see business model, actually. Actually, for them, business model has been used in information system literature in general, like mainly for explaining the function that they do in the organization. And that function could be as an alignment instrument with the whole work, the whole literature, which is in business alignment between the business strategy and the whole operation of the organization, actually. But it has been also used to see how we can share knowledge, how we can manage all what is the knowledge capital of the organization with the business model. And it has been also as a kind of intermediate layer and interface between the whole logic of the organization and the business processes that we are in, in interviewing, actually. And it has been used as well, mainly for modeling purposes, like the information system community, which could be conceptual modeling to have multiple level view of the organization, to try to express the dynamicity uh, of, of, of the organization, etc. And something which caught our attention is what he called the business, the dimension of the business model, actually the business model dimension, which he mentioned that any business model he comprised of four dimensions, which are the value proposition the value architecture, the value of finance, and the value network. And we decided for this work that we want to focus mainly on the business model dimension, actually, to say, okay, let's analyze what are the dimensions of business model in the case of data sharing, actually. And these are the definitions given by Avison in the paper. So the whole idea of the value proposition is pretty much central in all the definition of business model. The whole idea that focusing on how to create value for customers by, by offering products and services, actually. But usually that creation of value requires as well to have an architecture, which the, he called the value architecture, which is the whole technological, but also organizational infrastructure required to create the value, actually. And then in creation of value with that architecture, we require to enable transactions and to coordinate those transactions and to have collaboration. And of course, in most of the business model in the organizations, we want to create some, some economic value for the own organization. And that's what is called the value finance, which is basic centrally and related to costing, pricing, revenue, and profit that can be done by the organization. So those are the definitions given by Avinson in, in his work that he got. Actually. So here I embark with the whole idea that let's analyze business model using those dimensions by Avinson, but I couldn't get rid of on my computer science and my requirement engineering background, actually. And then I decided to combine this with a methodology which is widely used in requirement engineering, which is the E3 value methodology, right? And it's actually, it's using requirement engineering and later on has been used in information system for expressing how value flow in business model, actually. So for us, it was very much convenient, actually. Um, bringing that, this is one of the seminar, this is a paper in IEEE software, which is one of the seminal uh, paper related to the E3 value methodology on that. How this work? So basically this methodology, what they try to explain is value, any type of value, it could be tangible or could be intangible and how it flows in organization, actually. So for instance, they got the view that any organization can have actors, actually, and those actors, they transfer among them value, actually. So this is a, a, a very simple example of a seller 
and the seller is selling goods to buyers. So there are different adapters, but the seller needs to comply to have compliance with the tax office in the government, actually. So usually the buyer, in order to get a good a product, he makes some payment, economical payment, actually. And the seller, in order to for selling that product, he has to pay some VAT to the tax office, and then he's meeting all the uh, legal requirements, the compliance requirement, and then send the buyer on that. So this is a very simple methodology, which got a very graphical interface and allowed us to to show how value flow of that. Okay. So this is a little bit of the background and let's get into the research and what was what we did here in the work. So I'm going back to the original research question that we have, how value is created in data sharing and how that value can be sustainable. Since this question were related to the how, we decided to have a qualitative research actually. And we decided to have a qualitative multi-case uh, uh, study. And then we decided to analyze two uh, data centers uh, that they were very much successful in the work that they are doing. One of them is the CCDC. This is the Cambridge Crystallography data center. This is the leading data center for data sharing and uh, data in the field of crystallography, material science. These are people design analyzing the components of different products. And then that company usually is expressed in the molecular structure, the crystallography structure. And they are managing the largest database or molecular structure in the world, actually. This is a community which somehow they are making partnership with publisher, for instance. And anybody that wants to publish, usually this is people that publish the paper that they research, and they, they publish along the paper the data. And the data usually is the structural molecular. And the main repository of that data is the CCDC, the Cambridge uh, Crystallography Data Center, which is a spin-off of Cambridge University, actually. So that was one of the organizations. And the other one is one related to the British government, which is the British Atmospheric Data Center which is the one which collect all the atmospheric data for people doing research in space science and atmospheric studies in the UK, actually. So we decided to move on them. These are organizations that have been running for a long time. Actually, the CCDC was created more than 50 years ago, actually. And, and, and the BADC got almost 30 years, actually. And they are mainly data sharing and they are serving to a large research and an academic community doing research in their respective fields. Actually, so for instance, this is the web page of the CCDC, and we can see that there are the moment sharing more than a, a million of molecular structure of the different companies that they do as well, actually. And this is part of the services that they, they offer, actually, in the CCDC. And, and this is the one of the British Atmospheric Center. Actually, they are called now, they changed the name, and now they're called SEDA, actually, the Center for Environmental Data Analysis. Actually, and, and they are offering for all the British community all the facilities that they require for doing atmospheric science or space science research in the way that they are doing on that. Actually, so how we collect data here, being a qualitative research. So, I this is I wouldn't call an ethnographic research because I I didn't go to the two places, but I just spent three months in BADC. Actually, so I went there and I was interviewing managers, I was taking notes, and I were investigating how these guys operate. Actually, so I interviewed several stakeholders, right? And we analyzed um, several documents that they were producing and try to understand how they were operating, try to discover the whole business model that we can do, actually. And then classical to qualitative research, what we did here was to follow two weight of analysis, actually. So I analyzed each, each place individually, actually. I didn't manage to go to the Cambridge uh, uh, data center. I focused just on BADC, but being in the UK at that time, I was interviewing several of the stakeholders and interacting and getting information from CCDC. Actually, so I analyzed each each place individually, and then we put together the two cases and try to see what were the commonality of that. They call our attention because both places, both sites are considered the leading ones in their own field. Actually, so it was really a good opportunity for me and for the team um, to analyze two successful companies, which somehow they were also being sustainable in different ways. I try to understand, okay, what are the key or the essence of that sustainability that they're having as well in the way that we were doing it. Um, so for the analysis, for the qualitative analysis, what we followed was what people call thematic coding actually. And then we were doing the interview and we designed an interview protocol based on having some business model dimensions view actually. Asking people like what are the main products, um, how is your architecture, how you collaborate, who are your partners, 
etc., and try to understand the way that they were operating, actually. And then we were using that as a, the main guide, and rather than being a la grounded theory, which is inductive, here we try to do the analysis deductive, actually, and starting from the top and then try to uncover uh, what were the operational and the business model that these companies had. So let's get into the findings of them, actually. And then the findings are the four dimensions, and then what we found in each organization. The whole idea of the value network, according to Allison, represents the way in which transactions are enabled through coordination and collaboration among the different parties, and how they collaborate, basically. It's a multi-party stakeholder network, and how value flow, flow in the way. And here, that was the reason I went to the E3 value, because the E3 value was very much convenient on that, actually. So we went back to the literature on data sharing, and then we look at the different kind of stakeholders. Usually, you were asking people, who are your partners? And they were doing, they were answering the closest ones, actually. The normal one, and they would say no. But usually in data sharing, you should be collaborating with A, B, C, D, E. I want to know what you are doing with all those different people, actually. So different role that they were doing. We were using this paper as a, as a guidelines to get the different stakeholder groups. And then when they were explaining to us how they were dealing and sharing, collaborating with all the different stakeholders. This is, for instance, the, the, the list of the stakeholders for the case of the CCDC. The, the crystallography community that they are doing. They are mainly dealing with data producer researchers, which are the main customers on that. With the, we can see in the way that they are doing it, in the main customer, which they produce the data. But they also deal with the com academic community in, 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 in general. Many of the paper of these people, in order to produce a new paper, a new research, I usually collect different molecular structure. I combine it, and then I create a new one, or I, or I report about that, actually. And a lot of the users, of that information came to be industrial users, companies doing research on material science or in the pharma sector in drug discovery, actually. So they analyze the molecules as well. And they have a very good partnership in the community with publisher because any publication has to be combined by the data. This is the tradition in this, in this discipline, actually. And this center serves like, forget, they got partnership with some, with Elsevier, for instance. And they are the ones receiving the data and doing the whole data curation of that data. And the, and the publisher don't worry about that as well. And they collaborate with, with several organizations, with some other data sharing organizations in similar fields, sharing data, and also a lot of software companies, which are also interested in exploiting that data. So it's really not simply, it's not a simple way of just sharing the data. There is a whole organizational structure that they are having around, around that, around the sharing of the data in the way that they are doing. And, and this is the value network that we, we have among them. And this is the way that we use in the paper and the entry value methodology, actually. So in this case, they are the organization CCDC is at the center. And well, this is somehow reflected the information that we collect in the interviews that we have with them and the document that we analyze, actually. And with some of them, for instance, with the other data sharing organization, they share data, but they mainly share knowledge, actually. How you are doing curation, how to manage this, this part, etc. With the academic community, they have several models that sometimes they have a licenses for people, or they got a premium model, and people can use by free some of the data, other people have to pay premium in that, in that way. And um, they collaborate with, with businesses, business pay them, pay for using the data. They also have consulting uh, part, they, they, they offer the expertise that they have, and they create services on top of the data, which they also offer, offer to, to businesses, etc. The whole relation that they have with publishers in terms of the maintaining the data, etc. So a whole way of explaining how they share data here, right? Another of the things that we tried to do was try to understand how they operate. And then we discovered that all these organizations, they didn't have a single value proposition, but rather what they have is several value propositions. Actually. And this is very normal when we will look back to the literature in social entrepreneurship, it's very normal in social entrepreneurship that um, enterprises, businesses there, they don't have a single value proposition. Usually there are several value propositions for all the different uh, stakeholders, actually. Everyone participated in, in social entrepreneurship usually try to get some value. The same situation is here because these companies can be seen, all of them are non-profit, so we can see them as well as a social enterprises, actually. So what we try to do was to flesh out, actually, what are the different value propositions that they are offered, actually. So for instance, for the people that produce data, they, the people that they produce data, eh, they are doing the whole data management in the way that they are doing it. Actually, they are also created ODI only for them, ODI for the data, and then people are recognized like a paper, 
actually. And people are in some universities, actually, you get points not only for your publication, but by your data and how your data, like citation, how your data has been used, actually, and they trace on that, actually. Also, how the data is consumed for the data consumers. They give value access to the data, access to all the different uh, services that they have. And then for the publishers, they got the transparency in the research pro uh, process. This is something as well for founders, etc. So for all the different stakeholders that we have before, actually, for all those stakeholders participated, they create a value proposition on that. Actually. Now, they have a value architecture, a technological and a complex organizational architecture, because actually they, they got the data, they have to create the data, but also part of the business model for them is try to create tools on top of the data. Tools, that's what they call the value added and tool that they create, like for instance, visualization and three dimension search, analysis of the structure, the molecular structure, etc. So this is part of the architecture that they are created on that. And, and in relation on how is the part of the finance, how they're doing it, they were followed with a freemium model, actually, which some of the services were free for the whole community, and then some additional added value services, people have to pay a, a, a premium. Actually. They also see themselves, they are non-profit, and then they sell a service community, so for instance, and then for they follow the UN scheme of developing countries or the, uh, the human development. And for some countries, all the services are free. And depending on the location of the country, the premium change from country to country, actually. So they are based in the UK, but they were serving to the whole worldwide community in the way that they are doing, actually. And this is all what we collected in the data with the, with the analysis with the CCDC. Let's see now in the case of the British Atmospheric Data Center in the BADC, actually. Um, so these are the main stakeholders. These guys, they collect a lot of the data, which are not necessarily coming from researchers, actually. They're coming from tools, like microscopes, like satellites, etc. And so they collaborate with organizations producing that data, and they store that data that they have, actually. So those organizations that capture the data, and they, and they, they collaborate on that. And they, they, these are the data producers. They are also, for instance, the UK... Um, they collect all the data of the UK of the meteorology office, and they are a sort of mirror for all the data that's collected by the NASA. They are the mirror in, in Europe in that data that they have. And then the main people using the data are researchers, doing research that they require that data, actually. But also, this is a data which is used as well by the general public. For instance, they mentioned to me in the interviews that one of the people that was looking at the data are journalists, scientific journalists. When they are the discussion of the climate change, they collect the data and they try to verify whether the claims that have been the people say are true or not, actually. So the general public is consumer, they work in hand with the founders, actually. So for instance, several of the council and the founders in the UK, if you are doing research in this area and you generate data, they they require the researcher to deposit the data in that repository, actually. And to acknowledge when you are using data from them as well, actually. And they require a lot of computational infrastructure. They use a lot of cluster computing. They use a lot of analytics. Um, so they require a huge cloud computing, cluster grid computing. So they are using as well a huge technological infrastructure. And they are with the infrastructure funders in the UK collaborated. And they, they maintain some of the data that they are doing. You know, they store the data on that, actually. And these are the main stakeholder. And again, we use the entry value to analyze how value flow here. Actually, so for instance, in the research funder, the research funder paid to them to maintain the data on that because they want to have transparency and efficiency in the way that researchers do the work as well. Actually, um, they offer the data by free to some of the general public, and in particular, that general public that want to get to see transparency in the research, etc. They offer as well consulting services for businesses that they can do as well. They collaborate with other research council, in particular, the research facility providers in which they, they pay and they receive some experience in managed large infrastructure that are required here. So these are examples of the way that value flow flow here in, the, in this case, actually. And these are examples of the value proposition as well for the different stakeholders in data management, access to the new data, um, efficiency in the research processes, transparency, etc. So they were similar on that, actually. In terms of the, um, of the finance, the BADC is mainly funded by the government actually, by the, Nat the Natural Environment Research Council in the UK. That was the main, the main one that they, they were funded on as well. So let's put the two organizations together and see what they have in common and what patterns are different as well in the way that they are doing. So both of them mentioned 
that partnership and collaboration are essential for the business actually either partnership with other industry with businesses or either partnership with the with the scientific community while right? interacting with them and hosting on them so that was central for them partnership and collaboration actually um and then the whole value network here for instance emerged as the key for the organization actually actually so for them how value flow the whole net value network was essential in them actually that was essential to the business and the way that they were operating in the business partly what they were doing actually in relation to the value proposition um they have similar value proposition being a data sharing for data producers and, and data consumer and both of them talk a lot about the term of value added services actually they were both of them emphasizing on that and they cover several services that they are doing either online portal for search in 3d or visualization data analysis data visualization in the way they were doing so they they have on that it was important to have clarity in the value proposition but it didn't have the same value at the value network that they have something which emerged put it together was that the main assets the main value that they change is data which that was expected because these are the this is the essence of data sharing but actually a lot of the value that they were created when we did the analysis was intangible transparency knowledge reputation actually so data preservation right um um expertise so actually a lot of the, of the work was sharing intangible assets actually and then some of the issues that they were doing and they didn't realize on that was that they were looking at the literature they were trying to come uh, to to transform those intangible assets in more tangible assets actually so they were having value conversions for instance try to convert something which is the data and then offering the value of the service of data visualization actually um or managing the whole process of recognition and to have the system that you can do the search like citations for the way that people have been using the, 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 the structural molecule and they also enhance in the value that they have for instance they create metadata about the data and that facilitated the search and the further exploitation of the data actually so they were working as a, a lot in value conversion value enhances in the way that we can do all that actually things in commons which for us also was very good uh, was for us a view that that's partly of the reason that these two organizations are so successful, which that they have in common. Both of them are considered themselves as customer centric, actually. The customer is at the center of them. And also they realize that they are in a business which data is growing almost exponentially, actually. And in some way, the technological architecture has to evolve almost all the time. So looking for new way or more efficient way of storage, looking for new way of doing better analysis, faster analysis, etc. And both of them also I have dedicated customer support actually. so for here the customer came essential because they are offering services for the customers actually but in most of the cases that customer which they are offering the services is also the one that is creating the data actually so if the customer is not happy the business is not operating anymore because nobody is going to store the data there actually so they really need to have the customer at the center in the way that they're operating because it's not only the one that pay you but it's also producing the data in, in, in the way that they are doing it actually now they were operating in different business model and then we went back to the literature in IES about different taxonomies in business model and in particular the one presented by Rapa and both of them depend on the customers but not only the customers depending on all stakeholders so we can see both of them as a community business model actually which both of them require high involvement of several stakeholders in order to generate product and services and the revenue came as well from the community because so the same community is the one that paid it actually to them so this is something which is very very relevant to have it in the community uh, 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 business model and also we went back to the literature and business model and try to go deeper how is value created here when we put together on them actually and for instance um thought uh uh offer in the management literature usually there are three ways of value creation the novelty the efficiency and the complementarity and we found that both organizations were doing both of them well, were all of them they were creating new value, new, they were creating new services, they were very much to exploit the collaboration efficiency, but what perhaps was more important was complementarity, actually. They were really working on how we combine services and create new value-added services. From the, the three classical value creation mechanisms, uh, we can say that complementarity was the most efficient one that they were using here in the way that we're using to it. And then in relation to sustainability, actually, 
um, we consider and we we were talked to them and we mentioned that that community business model they should emphasize on that actually um, to have the value network is relevant for them. We were explaining how they generate value to the different stakeholders actually, but also we saw them created not only economical value actually, but partly of the whole idea of sustainability business model is that the business model should create sustainability in terms of the economic value, but also to have something which is more ecological also social value. And for us, they were using a lot of social value actually. They were serving the, the research community, but also they were trying to offer expertise and helping the researchers in the world that we're doing. For instance, also in the case of the CCDC, they have a lot of collaboration and try to help research community in developing countries in order to facilitating the access to them, to the data, and they can carry on with the research activities there. Actually. So they saw that as a sort of win-win situation for both organizations on that, actually. And we conclude that that emphasis on the creation of social value, it was going to be central for the sustainability of the projects of that, actually. So what will be the conclusions that we can say in terms of the study and the business value dimension, actually? So in relation to the fourth dimension, the, uh, the collaboration network value, right, that create came like the main one that we can got here for this, for this type of uh, enterprises in data sharing, actually. But also they should put a lot of attention to all which is intangible assets, actually. Most of them, they were focusing that the value created is just the data, but they are doing a lot of intangible value. And the way that guarantee the sustainability is as well to see in which way they can do value conversion or value enhancing and converting or transforming that intangible into tangible, that they can go back to the economical value that they require in order to, to carry on operating in a long term, which is partly what they wanted as well with the sustainability, actually. And we were one of the few studies that is using actually the E3 value as well to analyze how value flow in this case on that actually. So what I was mentioning, when we were invited to do this research, actually this has been uh, an opening for us and we carry on doing research on that. I have at the moment, for instance, um, so analyzing and going deeper uh, on data sharing and analyzing from the point of view of value, but not only creation, but co-creation actually. And here we're using a model that was uh, proposed by uh, Robert and Colin in MSQ to an IT value co-creation because we can see what they are doing depends a lot on technology and we can see the world that they're operating as an example of IT value. Actually. So my student is using, is, is not only doing data sharing, but data sharing non-scientific community and looking as well in businesses and using as the underlying infrastructure data sharing in digital platforms in the way that we can do. Actually, we are also working on how is managed, how is doing the whole management of the collaboration. And we are leveraging here in the notion in, in management of collaboration network orchestration and how we can orchestrate uh, those, those collaborations. So we try to analyze here on that. And also we noticed that the e value methodology has been used in previous work to design patterns of business model. And we try to see if, whether we can use to come out of these patterns that depending on the type of organization, this is the way that the value flow, classical way, sort of blueprints, patterns in the way that value is created in this organization. Um, with that, I think um, I'm finished for the moment. I'm really happy for any question, any comments. Right. All right. Well, okay. Thank you very much, Alvaro, for this very insightful uh, talk. Uh, while people are thinking and, and formulating their questions, I already have a question for you. You know. But when, when we're talking about sharing and well, data sharing or any sort of sharing, uh, it's always going to be something that, or at least we think of it as something uh, that happens in a collaborative way, right? Uh, and I noticed that your two, the, the, the two organizations that you studied were not-for-profit organizations, where collaboration tends to be a little maybe easier. I mean, uh, I, I, I myself have also been studying collaboration among uh, interested parties, let's say, or selfish parties that collaborate because they understand that by collaborating, they can get to something better together. Uh, but the problem always seems to be, to me, the, uh, a matter of governance, right? Uh, from your talk, I understood that the govern governance here happens because they, their, let's say, their, their goals are aligned. But is, is that all that they have? Or how did you perceive the governance among all those parties that were so... Okay. Implicated there. Okay, actually, in those two organizations, the goals are aligned. Actually, in terms of like, for instance, 
the collaborations that they have CCDC with publisher actually. They are really giving value to the publisher because the publisher requires that when you publish, you deposit the structure, but they don't worry about the management, the maintenance of that. This is done by them. So they are really aligned on that. Actually, what you are mentioning is the topic in the first bullet point that I mentioned here, and that's has been the topic of my PhD student, actually. When we move to the business collaboration and data sharing in business, it's another story, actually. And that's for instance, we presented a paper in ANSYS, and that was the focus on how we manage the tension that we got in competition and collaboration. Actually, because I'm collaborating, but at the same time, some of them are competitors. Actually, and then how we manage the tension that is get on there and governance there it became really really central. Actually, and trust management as well, the issue of trust establishing here, and we need to have a very good governance for for, for managing that tension that we are doing. So we already we are extending, we analyze, we are using as well with my uh, with my DBA student. We use already one case study that we presented in Anansi this year on managing that tension. And we are enlarging that with a second case study and going deeper on, on that situation, which is different. Here, it was much easier and governance I haven't made much relevant because perhaps the fact that they are non-profits and they are aligned on goals. But when we're moving for profit, the story comes, and in particular, the competitors, actually, how we share information, but that you cannot use it. First, um, I want to congratulate Alvaro. I think the study is very helpful and understanding the how this model works for not for our time which is a digital and data time so this is a really you know um appreciate that for for i will use it my students uh, and i wanted to ask you because in latin america we have two problems that when i see the model i find it you know very very clever and um, but what, what about in latin america we don't have the we have trusting problems uh, with interoperability in most of the universities and 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 relation with businesses and besides this, uh, collaboration is difficult among uh, stakeholders. Uh, in Latin America, the trust is a problem. Government uh, is not trusted by the academic, uh, government don't trust academia, academia don't trust uh, uh, government, businesses don't trust. <laughs> so at the end, the, the model collaboration and as a community is very difficult. So what, what, what do you think could be the starting point to have this working? Actually, um... That's a good question, and it's, it's interesting because this is a question that asked me several people. In Colombia, we got that situation, actually. I started my academic career after my PhD. I went to work in Colombia, and I was working for four years in, in, in Bucaramanga, in Universidad Autónoma de Bucaramanga, and actually I was giving up a talk to them last year, and, and they said, but you are writing paper with competitors. And I remember that, 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 that like other business schools, which are competitors, and they would say, well, I think one issue that we we need to extrapolate it and is try to convince our senior managers in our academic institution is that we are in the business of doing research and research is a team players, right? And and we cannot play ourselves alone because we know we can play, but we, we it's very difficult to, to score a goal actually. We may make a good pass, but if we want to score a goal in a very good journal in a very top journal we have to have several people working together and collaborating actually and and who better to collaborate actually that our colleagues that also know our field and they have more seniority etc even so if we are competitors actually at the end if we publish the paper it's going to be a win for the university in that so that was my answer to them actually because i remember and i, and I was surprised i was working with them more than 20 years ago Actually, or 20 years ago, and I said, and 20 years ago, we were in that discussion. Actually, and um, we were somehow you not know, very well look collaborating with the university, which is only five blocks from here. Actually, but actually, we, we, we need to collaborate. Actually, and I would say we need to convince them that this is good for us, good for the country, good for the production of the, of, of, of the science in the way that I see it. So, for me, the limitation, the limitation among collaboration among universities is more the senior managers. Actually, another story going to the other question that is the trust with businesses. Actually, I think we need to. Well, I, I'm not sure about that. I would say, um, what we need to show businesses is that if we do research, they we create value as well. We can do it as a data sharing. Actually, this has to be something which is generating value for all the participants. I try to say that when I do qualitative research, for instance, we are doing interview to a company. I try to say then in advance, and at the end, I'm going to generate a report. I'm going to send it to you. 
I'm going to, if you want, I can go to your company and talk and explain the result, giving the academic view of what you are doing and how you can leverage on that. But I, I got the feeling that I need to pay back the time that they are giving to me and the data that they're providing to me. And that's usually the view. So, and in most of the cases, and at the moment with another launching another project and I'm in the, in the face of getting, getting companies willing to be interviewed and to be a study, and I, I'm part of the work is to analyze that. And we go with the comment from Alexander, and we have been forced, forced, no, but actually, Europe has been forcing universities or have been saying it's very good to have transparency. So now, for instance, that when I did this research, that wasn't the case. Now, when we go to any company, we need to have um, information consent, explaining all the data that is collecting, how it's going to be published, and if they want to revise the data, that they can drop the information, all that. In that, in order to enhance transparency and to increase trust with the businesses, actually. So I try to sell them the idea that we collaborate and we collaborate to that whatever I do, I'm going to try to transform in something good for them, creating value for them, actually. And that, that and my work here is a little bit convincing them on that. Great, thank you. Pleasure. Sure. All right, anyone? Otherwise, I have another question here. You know? I will not <laughs> allow over to, 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 to be quiet there. <laughs> really, please. Hello, Alvaro. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting for me because I did do some um, parallelization, let's say. Um, and you said you had um, the surprise of finding social value and on top of financial value, right, or economic mm -hmm. value. I did the, the like, transfer that idea to my research because I'm researching on in government. So we have the, the, the figure of um, public value, right? And we have the same um, questions and, and, and how do you say, the same thoughts about trust, um, how you need trust to have uh, and transparency to have the collaboration. And this is very important for that data sharing also in government, also to, to raise public value. So um, I wanted actually, it's not a question, I wanted just to share with you how important your work is for, um, for my work so I can um, certainly take get some ideas from your work and and use them in my research as well. Okay, no, I'm glad to hear that. And I'm referring in the paper, the work of Alan, which is somebody working on value, conversion on value on Hansen. And I got the idea that, because actually, we have been also analyzing this situation in public organizations, actually. And, and, and okay, and in this case, BADC is a private organization, but, uh, I'm sorry, CCDC is a private one, but BADC is, is a government, it's funded mainly by the government, actually. And several in the, in the public or the sector, actually, there is a lot of power, uh, value conversion, a lot of value enhancement. And actually, some of the, I would say, some of the missions of the organization is not only, the mission is not generating economic value, no profit. It's serving the communities, actually. It's social value that we created. And a lot of the value transformation, the value modification, the value enhancement conversion, it may help in show how value is created, actually, how that, that social value or any other type of value. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you. Okay, pleasure. Silvio. Okay. Alvaro, I was thinking bec uh, because I work for a, a global company. Uh, we are in more than 100 countries and uh, we have more than 100 kind of business. You know? And we have an interna internal competition. Uh, some, uh, in some uh, moments I can say, ah, we need to do this in Dinamarca first. After that, we share the data and the information with the global. You know? uh, the international inter internal competition it's a problem to you know to share data. Actually, and um, this is, I mean, um, what Alexander was asking at, at the beginning, actually, the, that tension in businesses is, is there, actually. And then, um, 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 from what we have seen, for instance, in one of the research that we are doing, the issue of governance, trust, it claims here very, very much central in the way that we can do, how we can enhance trans, uh, trust here, actually, transparency on that. Now, several of the cases is managing the tension that we got actually, because we need, as my example, when like Aurora was asking, collaborating with, with, with university, but it's also collaborating with businesses as well, actually. And several of those businesses are competitors, actually. 
And then in those collaborations, sometimes we are disclosing information which is value for the competitor and we don't want to do it, but it requires in order to have a success collaboration if we got something in, in common. Actually. So we need to have a very clear here rule of games, which is governance at the end, actually. How we can play and how can we share here. Actually. So Thank you. Uh, maybe going going back to the the issue that Aurora raised, uh, that we it's interesting because in Latin America we I mean the stereotype is that we are open hearted and that we share, but we uh, when we we notice uh, the way our organizations work, we see what Aurora already reported. You know, each one trying to do their own thing, uh, and I feel that uh, maybe this has to do with uh, education. The other day I was teaching my undergrads uh, a class on information flow in the supply chain. Uh, they were computer science students, and uh, when they realized the problems uh, in information uh, flow, they said, oh, that's very easily fixable. I mean, we just have to have to wire up those uh, all, all the different agents, uh, and they will be able to share information among them. And I said, well, but the problem is not the technical issue of, you know, I mean, you can, you can make the information go to the moon and back in a, a fraction of a second, but uh, to convince uh, a cell, let's say a selfish agent, that that information that he or she thinks to be strategically important uh, should, should and could and should be shared with, uh, with and, and I'm talking about partners, I'm not even talking about the competitors. Uh, that's very difficult. So we, what I see in, in Latin America is, a, uh, and I think it's, it's, it happens elsewhere in the world as well, is that we are very eager in optimizing locally and we miss the opportunity of optimizing globally simply because of our difficulty in sharing. Uh, so this is why I think your research is, is already very interesting and, and it will it gets to an, another level of interestingness i just invented that word here right <laughs> now that you now that you get to to for profit organizations because having them sharing will probably take us to another level of civilization let's say <laughs> all right uh, questions andrea you open your your camera there i thought you had you had a question you but you didn't raise your hand so i don't know <laughs> No, I just, I mean, I I found the uh, research design very interesting and the way it was designed and all the the tools and the theoretical um, base that it was, uh, that was chosen. Very, very inspiring, very interesting for someone who wants to do a qualitative research as well. So that was very nice. Thank you. Gracias. <laughs> nice to hear that. <laughs> Uh, going back, maybe those who like soccer know Gerson. Gerson, I don't know how you would say it in Spanish. It's one of those Brazilians from the 1970, uh, 1970 World Cup together with Pele and others. Gerson uh, was, well, he was a famous Brazilian uh, player, but he had this unfortunate moment in advertising. He was, do at the time that uh, it was still possible to advertise for cigarettes, he was doing this advertisement for, for the cigarette brand here in Brazil. Uh, and, and the saying, or, or, or his saying was, Brazilians love to take advantage every time. Uh, and I, I don't know if they were uh, selling a cigarette that was one centimeter longer or something, but was, what, what he was, uh, the message was, we all want to take an advantage. Uh, and I always think of this taking an, an advantage as the opposite to sharing. Uh, and uh, so th this is why I think that it's so challenging to us to Understand that by sharing, we can do much more together than by simply competing uh, in any other right. situation. <laughs> but, but, but that's a global situation. It's not only in our countries. It's something globally, actually, I would say. It's true that in some cultures, it's much open to share, but, but, but the challenge is everywhere, I would say. I think you mentioned uh, uh, building trust as, as something important. Maybe that, that could also be uh, another, let's say, line of research there Alfred, for another PhD student. Uh, right. see, how, how do we foster trust? Because trust is, is also something difficult for organizations that want to have other results for yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. Trust needs time to be uh, uh, conquered and, and, and very little time to go away after, you know, yes. any of the parties do something that the others feel that breaks that trust. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I, we're, we're, I, I think we're in a, how do you call it, a, a mind area here uh, for for. For, for, for organizations that are there in business for profit, because they surely will benefit from sharing more. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they, they're always thinking that whatever they share will be uh, used by competitors or by others 
adds their uh, expense or they, they, I don't know. It's uh, so I, I think that that's our challenge. Whoever is, is studying sharing, I, yes. regardless of if it's information sharing or or any other resource sharing, we'll, all, we'll have to figure out how to 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 deal with that in the future. Yeah. Maybe if we want to take that to other um, organizations that not just the, the not for profit and actually I I got one student working on trust evolution, but knowing data sharing. Uh -huh. Actually, he's doing the research in the case of a company in which the company developed a software and the software got unintended consequences. It was a completely disaster. And then the whole employees decided we are not using this anymore, actually. And then the company re go back and create a new implementation. And then it was has been a, a complete success, actually. So usually people analyze that from the view of what are the success factors from failure to success? But we are looking in a different angle, which is people in the first implementation completely lost trust in bosses. Actually, because also one of the intended consequences, which was unexpected, was that employees end up earning less money, less commission. But it wasn't unintended. It wasn't cre created in that way, actually. Uh, and some of the technical problems in that to having organizational problem, we made complex and people didn't manage to get the goals and didn't get the bonus because of the technical problem. So you create a huge problem that people were not trusting to the company. And then later on, they regain trust. So we are we try to analyze what the company did to gain trust back from those employees, which um, which were very, very disappointed with organizations. And they, they didn't believe that wasn't intended. Actually. So how what they managed, because nowadays people are happy and people are using the system. Actually. And, and very interesting because this is an analytic system. Actually, so they brought analytics for our having efficiency, but the first implementation was a disaster. And then people uh, people were managing things and they were sending it, sellers were sending to the wrong place, customers were not getting the, the, the products, and then it was completely completely it was a routine system, a routine uh, uh, doing an optimizing distribution of products, and then the optimization was terrible, the first version. Actually. And then but the intended consequences. Uh, it was terrible because for people, most of the people, the salary was coming from bonus and they were commissions and they were losing the bonus and the commissions. Right. And then they were, they were unhappy on that. And then, so I'm looking at that. I'm going to trust is something very interesting. Right. Andrea. Right. Uh, Andrea. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, I was just uh, wondering what you said about this sort of partnership between uh, academia and the government and uh, the companies the, the for-profit companies, and I, I, I'd like to know how, uh, why is it like in Spain right now? Because I lived in Spain uh, 15 years ago, <laughs> studying in, in Barcelona in 2007, 2008, 2009, <laughs> and I remember um, it, it wasn't uh, like, um, how can I say that? It, they didn't work together as in the US, for example, or in the UK or in Germany. So I'm just curious right now, what is the situation in Spain right now? Or maybe in in Western Europe, I don't know if you can say that, uh, or Latin Europe. <laughs> right, I mean, it's still a challenge, collaboration, actually. And I would say, collab but collaboration, we're going back to trust, actually. Collaboration is about gaining that trust, actually. Yeah. Which is true in some, in some places, it's much easier, or people are more open to share and that relation business university in most natural and collaborating with colleagues in Denmark, for instance, and in Nordic cultures, I see which the assets work companies and that work that I need to do or lobby and convincing that whatever I'm doing for the company create value. My, my Nordic colleagues haven't much, they have it difficult, actually, but they spend less time on that. Actually. So there are some cultural issues, I would say, but it's a challenge everywhere, actually. And then it, it influences. I would say it influences issues of reputation of the organization, your own reputation, um, the companies, etc. Right. Um, several universities have created centers which help in creating that kind of collaboration. So, for instance, we we that you are interested in public sector. So, for instance, talking about the public sector, we got a center um, uh, specializing the public sectors, and we have been using them in order to do some of the research and to reach some 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 uh, some town some majors some politicians or some ministers that we want to interview actually 
so is helping helping them as, as a platform they are with a different mission because they collaborate in academia but they are not doing a strong research but mm -hmm. when we want to do research they are really happy and again i'm going with the back to them we say look um we are going to mention you in the research and this is also good for yeah. you and i have to do the work with them yeah, yeah. And my broker yeah no yeah. and another uh question just very my very last one <laughs> i promise um how is the i, I don't want to say the market but the situation for us latin americans if we want to be a, a professor or pursuing an academic career in a uni, in a university in in spain for example because in 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 barcelona it was very hard i remember i don't know if it's because it's catalonia and we have to speak catalan to be a professor sometime you know but uh, what is it uh, like in in madrid for instance actually i i prefer to answer in general actually um, okay for instance I, I got my first academic position in Europe, living in Colombia, actually. Um, and, and, and I would say I was, I saw in the AIS world, right? No AIS world, actually. At that time, I was also subscribed to CE world, software engineering world, actually. And I saw the post and I decided to apply, actually. And they interviewed, actually, what I complained a few years later to my bosses was <laughs> that I have it even more difficult than other people because I have like four interviews before, wow actually in order to get that but actually they they told me we need to be sure that the one that we saw in the computer and in the phone was you but i would say most of the universities are really open to people from everywhere we tend to do opening which are international we are now at the moment hiring faculty actually and our faculty our applications are for all over the world actually so if the people is good and the people got the potential to publish in top journal, which is what we require. Yeah. It doesn't matter where it's located. Okay. And is it is it uh, necessary, of course, to speak like fluent Spanish or just English? No, actually, we we teach mainly in English. Oh, ah, okay. And and the top business school, at least in Spain, the top business school, most of the teaching is in English. Actually, we we teach in Spanish almost twenty percent of the okay. whole classes that we do. Actually, okay. most of our classes are in English. Actually. All right. So, and I would say. Um, yeah, in most of the business school, even in France or Germany. Oh, so we have a chance. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing the, the brain drain of Latin America happening here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's so right. many, so many amazing researchers from 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 Latin America all over the world, and we've seen so many amazing works and professionals and people doing incredible research in 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 these uh, seminars. I mean, it's so nice, it's so right. inspiring. Right. Yeah. So, so I mean, the the, the work. The language, the working language in most of the top business schools around the world is English, actually. Okay. So, and most of the teaching is in English, actually. So, in some countries require, and then when we look at the situation in Spain or in other countries, when you want to work in organ in public universities, maybe it's different. Actually. Okay. For instance, in the Nordic countries, in public universities, some of the posts require that you speak Finnish or you speak Danish, uh, uh, the local language, actually. Yeah. But in other posts, they don't they don't require it. Actually. Yeah, I come then, from yeah. from communications. Uh, I'm I'm a journalist originally, so maybe that's why uh, they re they may require the mother tongue of the country because it's not business. It's it's maybe a different field. It but that's be. very nice to know. Thank you. Right, yes, <laughs> I mean it's like um, in public university the situation is different, but usually. Um, even public ones, but the ones that are really uh, in, uh, playing at the international level, they are open to people and, and they require people that we don't do that, but they require people that eventually after a few years to speak the local language because maybe they right. need to teach there, actually, which for me makes sense. But uh, yeah, but you know, one, one, thing that, uh, right? you know, one thing that probably happens, I know that it happens, it happens in Spain, for example, for the public universities, uh you have to be spanish i think no uh, no 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 the thing is there is a lot i mean the, i don't want to get into the system yeah, no. here but, but <laughs> system no, i'm saying that i'm saying that because i have a brother who's a professor in spain in a private university his his daughter and his sorry his wife who is spanish developed a career in a public university but at least at the beginning uh, it was more difficult i don't know how it, uh, no, it's how still how difficult it. actually there, there is another problems in the public sector in the public universities but nothing to do with their nationality is more like uh, endogamia, which is like mainly the people that are starting the career are the people that finish there, actually. 
And I think the government is trying to promote to be more open, actually. But it's very normal in public universities in, in Spain, which most of the professor of the faculty is the people that study there. Actually. Uh, they all right. continue there. Okay. Have nothing to do with the nationality, which is more related to to that kind of endogamia, which mm -hmm. they. Silvio is probably tired of having his hand up. Very interesting. Alexander told about the, the trust, and uh, I was speaking about the COP26. Uh, we have, for example, in Brazil, 15 companies study the, a product to replace the cement. It's a very important thing for the environment. And uh, in separate resources. So, so this kind of study is very rich because it uh, shared this kind of data for this kind of result. It's very important, and how we can motivate or provoke these companies to use that study to share data because it's very important. <laughs> I know it's a strategy. Uh, it's a little bit about strategic, strategic, no? Right. Strategy. Sorry, strategy. Uh, but it's important for the world now. <laughs> yeah, de definitely. Um, but I think some universities in is, in Brazil are in data sharing actually because, for instance. The project that I was mentioning, which is one that I got in my slide, the paper in MSQ about CERN, which was a huge project on grid computing, actually. And so even some of the nodes were based in Latin America, and there was a local network of data center in Latin America from universities sharing that data and contributed the people from particle physics. I know because my, my alma mater in Colombia, University of Los Andes, was part of the network. And one former colleague was the one managing the data center for the Large Hydro Collider experiment, which is the name of the study for Colombia. So it shouldn't be a surprise that that, that notion of data sharing scientific, at least, in, at least in some communities like particle physics, is doing it in Brazil as well, actually, because these are very much international collaborations, actually. Those people doing research in that area, happen is in those disciplines, they understand that research is collaboration, right? And then they, they, they actually, when you look at the papers, in particle physics, sometimes it's, lot, it, it's funny for us because these are papers with 30 authors, actually, mm -hmm. right? Which are the people from all the different parts contributing. To, in, but in those communities, it's normal, actually. People contributing at different levels. So for some communities, maybe much easier than others, actually, right? But but by sure, it's happening, right? All right. Well, thank, thank you, you Alvaro. While we were uh, answering, Silvio, Andre, and Carolini were exchanging messages there and planning their future as uh, international researchers. I think that they already have the duty now. For we, we, we have three three more uh, uh, speakers uh, this uh, this year. Uh, each one of them is going to be from a a, a uh, different. No, actually, two two North Americans. And and next week we'll have Mike uh, Myers from New Zealand. Okay. So we have an opportunity of asking. The opportunities that exist there as well for researchers from other parts but as uh, you, you probably already noticed uh, uh andre and carolini that uh, th if there is one area that allows for mobility in the world that's research that is academia i mean uh it's it's very easy for you to go abroad first uh, during your phd to do part of your research you, you start having connections it's it's easy for you to to attend uh, international conferences well we hope it, it's going to be again right after the pandemic uh <laughs> And uh, and then connect to people, do research together, and that opens doors. You never know uh, where you, you're going to be working in a in a few years from now. So, yeah, Andrea has her hands up again. So, if there is one thing that these seminars um, have has have brought, at least for me, was a very um, a very broad horizon of possibilities. And I would love to be a, a professor and a researcher around. I mean, international or national, whatever. But seeing all these amazing and brilliant researchers from Latin America, you know, from our reality that sometimes is, is, is harsh, it's difficult for science. And to see people like you, Alvaro, and so many other researchers that made it and that work hard and have uh, and are successful abroad, you know, it's very inspiring. I'm very happy. And, you know, yeah. one of the things we're, we're, we're discussing here, the, the, the difficulty that we that that we see in companies sharing but you'll never see that problem with uh with academia in, with in academia as Alvaro was saying uh well the, the the researchers themselves will never think that they're competing against their, their their colleagues in fact we're always trying to figure out new ways of building bridges like the research seminars here this this is i mean if we see the the number of different universities that are here participating with uh professors and students involved uh and uh and uh, of course there is no in, in, in this case there is no 
monetary profit for anyone. We are all doing that because we think that by doing this, uh, we, we provide a richer environment for, for our students. Right? Yes, and, and you have no idea how much you inspire and you, you, you make us like believing in, in our potential. I mean, and just yeah, try and do something. I, mean, you know? I, I, I came to Europe been working already for years in, in Colombia. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was already, I, I, I study uh, funded by the Colombian government and I want to go back to my country because also my scholarship required, but also I want to give back what the country has given to me, actually. And then at some point, I decided that I want to go back to Europe and the original plan was going for two years. So I applied to a postdoctoral position and I got the position. Happened was when I was there, they offered me to go into the tenure program and then I ended up <laughs> staying, staying there. But, but, yeah, but I, went, I, went, I went originally only for two years. Wow. Okay, with the whole idea of coming back to Colombia again. Okay? After those two years, and then it's it's nice. right. especially yeah. after the pandemic, I think we can um, have a more hybrid um, way of living. I mean, we can be here and we teach you abroad. We, we can be abroad and teach uh, in Brazil or in, in any other country as well. So this is um, a new opportunity that has come with the pandemic. Right. Well, I don't want to teach hybrid. I want to. I want to go to Europe to teach. I don't want to teach in Europe. <laughs> in Europe and contribution in your country. You don't have to be in your country to give a contribution. To yes, me. of course. I'm just. Yes, yes. Yes. And you know, Andrea, there, there are again uh, the world has shrunk uh, over the years. Uh, now, of course, the pandemic has uh, tore us apart again. It seems that the distances are a little further than they were a couple of years ago. Uh, but there is, a, a, I mean, the, the fact that you can be virtually close allows you to be in a in, a, in another moment also physically close because I, yeah, I mean, of you, course, yeah. yeah. So there, there's there's a there's the good, uh, for sure for sure your generation of uh, of uh, professors and, and researchers is going to be even more international than ours because uh, the world is much smaller uh, in your yeah. minds uh, and also. Uh, in the way that uh, even the, the schools think uh, uh, of it, and for example, having Donna's students taking this course here at UTFPR, right, and 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 be able to, to, to be accredited by that, it's something that uh, a few years ago would not be even conceivable. But now we, I mean, now we see that things are possible. We start doing it, uh, and so so don't worry. Uh, that that path is already you know the the, the way to go. All right. Well, uh, any any further questions? Uh, otherwise, I, I'd like to just uh, uh, advert uh, well. Thank again, Alvaro, for such a great. Uh, uh, okay, I'll, I'll be back to you, Aurora. Thank, thank, thank Alvaro for this, and then after Aurora's uh, uh, intervention, I, I just want to, to tell you what we're doing next week. Okay, Aurora, please. Yeah, just 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 to just to to let uh, Alvaro know that we are part of LATKAIS, the Latin American chapter of AIS. All of the most professors here, and we have a journal that uh, is publishing articles in in the area of 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 MIS in Latin America. So we wanted to invite you in any case that you have opportunity to send a paper and uh, we will be very glad because uh, Alexander is part of, and Marianne also is part of the journal. I am I am the editor and, and we are looking for, for good quality research that uh, can inco incorporate some of the Latin American problems. So uh, just this, uh, sorry, Alexander, for taking the Thank time. you for the invitation. Sure, I will take it into account, right? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. I'm, I'm just uh, uh, cutting and pasting here the information that uh, uh, someone asked about uh, uh, the links. Uh, so just give me one second here and I'll, I'll include that in our session. Where is it? Uh, let's see if this will work. Um, where is it? Uh, just a second. Here. Yeah, the, so, so whoever uh, wished uh, to have the links for attendance and the link for, uh, for our, our Moodle where we have all the material, uh, the calendar with the with the three uh, sessions that we still have. In fact, next week we will have uh, Professor Michael Myers with us. Uh, well, he'll, he'll be talking to us about autonomous uh, cyber physical systems. Uh, uh, he's been also an, an author with a lot of very interesting and impactful papers in, in academia over the, the years. I remember the last year when he, he wrote about uh, digital transformation and, and, and included the idea of digital first in one of his M M MIS quarterly papers that caused a lot of debate among even among ourselves here in our research center. So now we'll have him with us, not to discuss exactly that topic, but to discuss this other topic uh, of interest uh, of his. And uh, and then uh, uh, early in December, we have uh, again Stacey, uh, Stacey Peter with us, and she will bring Laurie Giddens, who was one of her students 
uh, earlier on and, and who inspired uh, that talk that she gave to uh, the Latin American uh, community in our last ISLA conference uh, on doing research that is uh, that, that, that is um, in, well engaging or that, that, that is responsible, that is uh, uh, cons uh, that, that considers improving the world in which we live and we hope that uh, they will expand on that topic. And then our last session for this year is going to be with uh, Professor Steve Alter, um, who will be talking as, uh, well, of course, I could only ask him to, to talk about the work system. It's uh, his perspective on uh, the way that we appropriate technology in, in, in organizations. And I think it's one that makes a lot of sense uh, compared to some of the other uh, models that we have been discussing in academia over the, the years. So we have still a lot to do over the next uh, three weeks. Thank you very much again, Alvaro, for being the, the Thank our, you for the invitation. our people. For the Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank See you. Guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.